Hello, and uh, welcome to today's message. What does it mean to be free? I don't know how often you've maybe stopped to think about this question. Is this something that crosses your mind from time to time? Freedom is often one of those things that we don't miss until we lose it. Um, when we have freedom, often we don't realize how great it is that we're able to do what we want when we want it. And of course, there are are, are many different ways of being free. Um, you know, freedom means different things to different people. We can have freedom from having to worry about uh, finances. Uh, we can have uh, freedom from, you know, living in an environment of fear, perhaps in armed conflict. Uh, so there are all sorts of different ways we could define what it means to be free. And uh, we're going to look at a passage of scripture today where the Apostle Paul talks about uh, the freedom he has and an important what that freedom means to him. And we're going to explore uh, uh, what he says uh, in, in, in this passage of Scripture, which is 1 Corinthians 9. And uh, we're going to turn there in a few moments. But I want to begin by uh, looking at the words of a Joni Mitchell song, uh, which is called For Free. So this is a song that she wrote uh, uh, quite a number of years ago. I think it was um, released in 1969 or 1970, about there. So it's been around for a while. And it was inspired by a real event that happened to her, that as she was uh, walking in New York, she heard a busker. And uh, I'm going to read the words. I'm not going to sing the words, so please don't um, <laughs> don't expect too much of me. But as I read these words, um, it's quite interesting because she, she captures something um, about what it means to be free that is quite relevant for the discussion that we're going to have um, about today's passage of Scripture. So, this is Joni Mitchell's words. I slept last night in a good hotel. I went shopping today for jewels. The wind rushed around in the dirty town, and the children let out from the schools. I was standing on a noisy corner, waiting for the walking green. Across the street he stood, and he played real good, on his clarinet, for free. Now me, I play for fortunes, and those velvet curtain calls. I've got a black limousine, and two gentlemen escorting me to the halls. And I play if you have the money, or if you're a friend to me. But the one-man band by the quick lunch stand, he was playing real good for free. And so what Joni Mitchell here is describing is the fact that as a professional musician, uh, you know, she got paid to play music. Uh, but as she was passing by, there was just a busker on the street. And for him, it wasn't even about the money. It was just about playing. And uh, she was really struck by how fantastically um, he was playing. And, and this is going to be relevant to where we pick up in 1 Corinthians uh, 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 chapter 9. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is addressing one of the challenges that he's facing with the Corinthian church. And that is that they want to give him money. And uh, uh, this is significant because the Apostle Paul uh, prides himself in basically not needing uh, support, in supporting himself as he travels around uh, sharing the gospel. And if you don't know how he does that, the main reason he does that is that he's a tent maker. And so he basically makes tents during the day, and then he preaches the gospel, uh, both while making the tents, but also um, in his free time. And in fact, in, in some of the places he would go, it would be quite hot. And he would even go to the marketplace, it's suggested, uh, during you know the time when a lot of people are having their rest in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day. And that's when he would tell people about the gospel message. So, let's leap into the passage of scripture we're going to look at. But before we do that... Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Roman, uh, 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 the Roman system of patronage because it's something that maybe uh, we're less familiar with in the West, and uh, this is a picture of a, a a Roman statue that we have here, and of course uh, the Roman statues were pictures of the most famous people in the area of Rome, people who had the wealth and the prestige to to be able to commission. Uh, these kind of works of arts. But this kind of represents what the Roman system of patronage was like at the time. 
because what would often happen is that you would have a, a wealthy patron um, and he would basically provide uh, for artists or musicians or traveling speakers to come and stay with him. And it would work well um, in the patron's favor because he would look like he was able to attract the most talented to, uh, to his house, to come see him, to his parties and events. And it would work well for the artists and the musicians because they would basically be able to be funded to do their art in a way that perhaps they weren't uh, uh, able to do without the support of a famous patron. But this was such an, a, a huge part of Roman society at that time. And you have to bear in mind that, that Paul was a Roman citizen. He would have been very familiar with this. And of course, so would the people in Corinth. Uh, uh, Corinth uh, was a Roman colony. The original Greek city had been raised by the Romans and refounded as a Roman colony. And many of the people in, in power and authority in Corinth at that time had been granted the power uh, and authority they had uh, through service to uh, the Roman Empire. Often they were in the army and then they were then given to these Roman colonies because it helped ensure that the Roman colonies uh, supported the Roman Empire, had links to the Roman Empire, and were able to help ensure that the local population did not rise up against Rome. And so these people would have been familiar. They would have been people who had used the Roman patronage system. That's often how they would have gotten their position. Um, and then in turn, they would have people who they were patrons to. And so this was very much a part of society. And uh, even in terms of Christian society, often you see at the end of Paul's letters, he talks about how he's meeting in people's houses. This would often be uh, uh, the richer Christian uh, patrons uh, who would host the kind of uh, uh, meetings and house churches in a way that a lot of the uh, uh, ordinary people uh, would not necessarily have been able to do. And so this was the way the system worked, but it was always a, a kind of quid pro quo to use uh, 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 that Latin term, uh, which is that there's always an expectation. The patrons would fund you, but there's an expectation, expectation that in return, uh, you would help improve the reputation of the patron that in some way you would do him a favor or a response. And so this is this is very much a, an essential part of Roman society. And so when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, the first part of Ro uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is talking about the freedom he has. And, and part of the freedom that he has been discussing um, is the freedom that he has to be able to be paid for his ministry. So he starts by having uh, an argument based on human authority, which is, you know, given that he's coming and speaking, surely just like anybody who was coming to, you know, uh, uh, somebody's house, uh, they would have the right to food and drink, especially as they were a speaker, as they were telling the gospel. They would have the right of a place to stay. And the Apostle Paul actually references uh, the other apostles, in particular Peter. And he talked about how uh, uh, Peter traveled with his wife. So his wife would help uh, support the Apostle Peter in his needs. But also in turn, when they stayed somewhere, it wasn't just Peter who would, who, who would need to be uh, looked after and, and be given food and a place to stay. It was also his wife. So he talks about how, you know, this isn't something that he does, but surely he still has that right. And then he goes on to talk about three other arguments for why, as an apostle, um, the Corinthians, you know, he had a right to ask the Corinthians to support his ministry. Um, and he, he goes on to quote uh, the law, the Old Testament, uh, from Deuteronomy 25 and verse 4 as an argument. He goes on to argue that if you look at the temple, and this was particularly probably talking about the temple in Jerusalem, uh, when you see what happens in the temple of Jerusalem, you know, the, the visiting speakers, they would have been given food and drink and a place to stay. And this would have been true not just for the temple in Jerusalem, but it also would have been true in the case of Greek temples um, at the time, that if they had a, a visiting priest, the priest would expect uh, their food and drink and a place to stay to be provided. Um, and then finally, Paul refers to an argument based actually on something Jesus says about the right of, of, of ministry workers, those who are sharing the gospel, uh, to be able to be put up by those they're sharing the good news with, to receive food and drink and a place to stay.
And so, so Paul is talking all about this, but it's important you understand he's not saying all this because he wants the Corinthians to provide for his food and drink or provide him a place to stay or even to support um, his ministry that he's engaged in. The point he is making is that he's not looking for the Corinthians support. And it's interesting when we think about maybe why the Corinthian church wanted to support uh, Paul and why Paul had so many reservations about it. And I think one of the important things to think about is the fact that if the Corinthian church was giving Paul money, they also would have had expectations of the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, by not accepting their money, meant that he didn't need to have those expectations. And we're going to pick up uh, this story towards the end, but it's important that we bear in mind that that even we in our lives, as we approach things in today's society, money means so much. And if somebody gives you money, often there's an expectation of something in return. And sometimes that expectation is not even something that is, is said outright but there is an expectation. And, and that can be even true in the case of when we give money to the church. If we give money to the church, we can have an expectation that we're going to get something in return. And so there can be difficulties in terms of whether it's right to accept money or not. And uh, often in the case of charities in particular in the UK, and uh, uh, in the case of a charity, they need to be careful about where they accept money from, because it's possible that the money comes with strings uh, that would not align with their charitable status. And that's also true for the church. It's possible that people could give you money on the condition that you do something that maybe isn't in the best interest of the church, or maybe even more particularly could contradict, uh, uh, you know, or, or, or put the church in a, a moral dilemma. And so these are concerns that perhaps the Apostle Paul is, 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 is having, that he's concerned about letting the Corinthian church become his patron. Because if you read through a lot of his letter, what he has to do a lot of the times in Corinth is correct them. Um, it, you know, in his letter, he doesn't shy away from pointing out when they've got something wrong or when they've misinterpreted something. And so here, when we're picking up this story about um, what is going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, we need to be aware that, that, that for the Apostle Paul, this could be one of the reasons he's turning down uh, their patronage um, in this particular case. Um, but let's move on and look at 1 Corinthians 9, and we're going to pick this up in verse 16. So this is what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He says, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with the stewardship. So what he's saying is he's, he's talked and come back to them about how he's not uh, looking for money, how he has a right uh, uh, to request uh, 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 that the Corinthian church support him, but that's not what he's doing. He's not exercising his right as an apostle, uh, as based on the arguments that he's made. Um, and when he preaches the gospel, it gives him no ground for boasting, is what he's saying. He doesn't preach the gospel so that he has a living. And of course, this, this, this can be a danger for anybody who enters into paid ministry, is that you end up doing paid ministry because you have to, as opposed to because you want to or you feel called to it. And uh, that can be true in any situation. And, and so often, so much of it comes to our own uh, uh, approach to a particular situation. Uh, you know, there are times when we can think of... Uh, uh, going out and doing the gardening as something that we really want to do. And there are times when we can think about it as a chore. And if we think about it as a chore, we can really not want to do it and put it off. But if we think about, you know, it's, it's a lovely day, I want to spend it out in nature, you can go out and do the gardening and, and really enjoy yourself. And of course, there are other circumstances like that in our life where our attitude changes so much. Uh, but what the Apostle Paul here is saying is that when he preaches the gospel, it's not so that in some way he would be built up or provided upon. 
Uh, in fact, he goes further and says that preaching the gospel, he feels, is a necessity that is laid upon him. It's something that, that, that he has been called to do, something that Christians are called to do, to share the good news, to tell people what Jesus Christ has done. And, you know, this is really important when we think about mission, because, again, often when we think about sharing the gospel with others of outreach and evangelism, we can have the wrong attitude. We can view it as if it's a chore, something that um, we have to do, that we're required to do. Uh, but for the Apostle Paul, as we're going to see, he had a different view. He didn't view it as something that was just a chore. Instead, he embraced it as something that was more than that. In fact, it was a delight. And at the heart of this is our own understanding of what the gospel message is. Is the gospel message good news? And, you know, we as Christians like to believe the gospel is good news. In fact, we go further than that. We, we like to say the gospel is the very best news. Understanding who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us through his death on the cross and through his resurrection. When we understand that, it changes everything. It changes our identity. It changes our understanding of the world around us, our understanding of our relationships. It changes, you know, our understanding of what love is, our understanding of what our future is, what the world's future is, what God's plans are. You know, understanding Jesus Christ is good news. And if it's good news, why wouldn't we want to share it with those, particularly to share it with those who need it the most, to share it with those who we know it would have such a positive impact on their life, to share it with those that we are closest to in our life. And so here he talks about in terms of necessity, but we need to understand that attitude plays a part on this. And to some degree, this is what we'll see, he pulls out of this verse. But he goes on to explain more about why he tells the gospel message and why he supports himself in doing so. So, for necessity is laid upon me to share the gospel, and woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I'm still entrusted with a stewardship. So what is he saying this? Well, he's saying that if he chooses to do this, if he chooses to share the gospel, and this is something that he's excited and passionate about, he will have a reward, and we'll come to, back to, to that in a moment. But even if he doesn't, he's still entrusted uh, to share the gospel as a stewardship. And what he means like that is as a servant. As a servant, he's still uh, entrusted with the gospel, and he still has a responsibility there. And, and he's probably referencing what Jesus says on this subject. This is from uh, Luke chapter 17 and verse 9. And here Jesus himself is talking. And he's talking about the expectations people had of a servant. And that if a servant had been working in the field when he came into the master's house, would the master just turn to the servant and say, you know, put your feet up? Or would he say, um, you know, prepare your dinner for me and then come serve me dinner? You know, the, the expectations that even the common people would have about the, the servant-master relationship would have meant that they would have expected the servant to 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 serve them in essence is what he's talking about and so this is what jesus says does uh, the master thank the servant because he did what was commanded so you also when you have done all that you were commanded say we are unworthy servants we have only done what is our duty and so here he's he's saying that you know so often in our life we want to be thanked for even doing the smallest things and we do small acts of kindness uh, uh, to please God, and then we we want God to thank us for do for doing what is really the bare minimum. This is this is what Jesus is saying in this passage. But instead, you know what he's saying is 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 you know as Christians, uh, there is a certain level of expectation of us. Now this isn't saying in any way. Please don't misinterpret that our salvation depends on our actions, on our works. That's not what's going on here. You know, throughout Scripture, uh, throughout the New Testament, it's very clear that our salvation is a gift from God. Uh, it's not given because of uh, uh, the works we do or, or that we are intrinsically worthy of it. Uh, on the contrary, uh, the, the gospel, the reason why it is good news is because uh, 
God saved us when we were unworthy, when we were unworthy servants who weren't even doing the bare minimum. But Paul here is very much viewing the sharing the gospel as something that he was called to do as a servant, uh, as a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he talks about how he wants to do more than just be a steward. And that's why he has the approach he has and is turning down the Corinthian offer or the implied Corinthian offer of supporting his ministry. So this is 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 18. Uh, this is how uh, Paul continues in his argument to the church in Corinth. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. So this is one of the ways that the Apostle Paul delights in being able to share the good news, is that he can present the gospel free of charge. You see, one of the things that we've kind of been talking about is is, is freedom. Um, you know, for the Apostle Paul, he's talked a lot. In fact, he begins uh, uh, chapter 9 by talking about the freedom he has as an apostle, as a Christian. And as Christians, we have been freed from slavery to sin. We have been freed from the law. Uh, uh, and, and that's the law of Moses, not the law of Christ, as we're about to go on and see. But it's important that as we read this and understand that, you know, what then is my reward? What is Paul talking about? He's talking about it's being able to give this gift of the good news without having to charge anyone. That's a reward. That's how he's approaching this, not just as a servant, but as somebody who wants to offer more. He wants people not to have to uh, offer up any payment to the Apostle Paul for the good news of Jesus Christ, for, for telling them about Jesus. And yes, he has a right to, 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 to have those Christians who've come to accept Jesus Christ, who have come to understand him, to support him in his ministry. As an apostle, he understands he has that right and he's not criticizing the apostle uh, uh, Peter or uh, 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 Jesus's um, half-brothers who were also uh, uh, you know, uh, preaching the gospel. He's not criticizing them because they do receive support from their congregations, but rather he's saying that this is one of the ways that, 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 that he rewards himself is that he's able to offer the good news without any hindrance, without any charge. And so here the freedom that he's accepting is that he's able to give this gift without attaching any strings in giving the gift. That's one of the ways that he finds himself rewarded in the sharing of the gospel. And in many ways, this reminds me of that Joni Mitchell song, because you have the idea of this clarinet player who's playing at the, the corner of two streets and as he's playing, it's this beautiful music that Joni Mitchell hears and appreciates so much. Um, and to her, it's, it's, you know, this amazing music that she would pay money for. And yet the reality was, he was this man on the street and he was just giving away this beautiful music for free. And why was he doing that? Part of that was because clearly he enjoyed playing. He enjoyed giving that music. And it's the same with the Apostle Paul. He enjoys sharing the good news. And he wants to be able to share the good news without expecting anything in return. To, to, to break out of that kind of uh, patronage system that was so prevalent at the time, where in his point of view, yes, he would be right to say to those who he brought to the faith, help me in terms of sharing this faith with others. But it's, it's a privilege to him to be able to, to do that without having to say that, to support himself through his tent making ministry. And so this is what's going on in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 18. But of course, he's tying it to everything else that's going on. Um, in his letter to the first Corinthians. And so he's tying on to first Corinthians 8 and, and, and other passages uh, as we are about to see. So let us keep reading. So this is what he talks. So he's gone about talking about wanting to, to give out the gospel for free. So that's in essence like offering somebody free beer. And now he's going to talk about the freedom he self he has, which is more like free speech when he's talking about the right to, 
to say what we think and 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 nobody can stop us from saying what we think you know that's the right to free speech and the right to free beer is like handing out free beer and somebody says thanks and, and they don't have to pay for it so there's there's a different sense in the terms of the freedom he's talking about but this is where he gets to the other freedom free as in free speech so he says for though i am free from all and he's talking about how he has been freed as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, and how he's been freed as an apostle. So though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. So even though he has freedom as a Christian, he's not indebted to anyone else. And even though in his freedom, he actually has the right to call other people to support him, what he has chosen to do with his freedom is to make himself a servant. A servant to all who will hear the gospel message. And this is very much modeled on Jesus Christ, you know, um, uh, uh, as the Apostle Paul, in fact, says, follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. And this is an example of how he's following Jesus Christ, who even though Jesus Christ was the son of God, even though Jesus Christ had great freedom, he chose to become a servant. He chose to give his life for you and me, and he chose to 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 go to the death, you know, to go to death on the cross for us. This is the gospel message. Um, and he goes further and he says, to the Jews, I became as a Jew. And this is a very odd phrase when you actually look at it, because, of course, Paul was a Jew. He was a Jew that had persecuted the Christians uh, uh, for many years. Um, uh, he was very zealous in his persecution of the Christians to the point where uh, some commentators believe he actually had Christians killed. It's not explicitly stated that way. We know that he was at the stoning of Stephen. Whether he threw a stone or not, it's not specifically told. Uh, but we do know that uh, uh, he looked to persecute the Christians as much as he could and, and actually looked to be sanctioned so that he could increase his persecution of the Christians. He viewed them as a dangerous sect of Christianity. But here we see that as he's, the way he's phrasing this, to the Jews, I became as a Jew. To him, he was no longer a Jew. He had been freed from thinking in the narrow confines of thinking of himself as just being Jewish. He was now Christian. He was now thinking of himself primarily in terms of a follower of, or of Jesus Christ and thinking of himself as being part of humanity as a whole as opposed to just being part of a, a, a racial or an ethnic group. And so here he's saying it is that to the Jews, though, he will become as a Jew in order to win Jews. So he will act and behave uh, culturally like a Jewish person so that he can tell them about the gospel message. Because the reality is, if you are engaging in a, 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 an ethnic group, the reality is often they don't mix very well with strangers or are very suspicious of strangers. So, so the Apostle Paul is saying he adapts to their culture for the sake of the gospel. And there are kind of provisions in this. You know, it's not that uh, he, he accepts everything or goes along with everything. There are times when it would be necessary to stand up and, and, and not follow a custom that would be contrary to something that, that, that Jesus has said or contrary to the gospel message. But he understood the importance of, you know, uh, uh, adapting to the culture he was in for the sake of the gospel, as opposed to, to, to looking down on the culture he was in, which is quite common, or condemning uh, 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 a different culture. And in this case, he no longer viewed himself as a Jew, but he was willing to become as a Jew, culturally behave as a Jew, in order to win Jews to the gospel. And he goes further and says, to those under the law, and this is the law of Moses, to those under the law, uh, I became as one under the law. So he followed, you know, the, the commands we have in the Old Testament. Uh, he would have attended uh, the synagogue on the Sabbath. And we know that's something that he did. And, and, and in fact, as he goes on to tell you later in 1 Corinthians, he actually was whipped by those um, in the synagogue. And they would only have whipped him if they viewed him as being under their authority. So they viewed him as being a Jew because of the way he was behaving. And he let them whip them. And why did he do this? Is because here he was being under the law, uh, uh, became like one under the law, so that way he could reach 
the Jewish people that he was evangelizing to at that time. And he's very clear here in saying that he became as one under the law. And then he, he very clearly says, though not myself being under the law. So he makes it clear that he's not under the law of Moses. Uh, but he does this so that he might win those under the law. And then he goes on to talk about, well, what about those outside the law? What about the Gentiles, as we call them? Uh, uh, those uh, who are in the, the Greek Hellenistic world, uh, which was the world that Paul was in. Who were these Gentiles? Well, they were outside the law. They were not part of ethnic Israel. They weren't part of of that culture and that society. They were viewed as outsiders. So to those outside the law, what does he say? I became as one outside the law. What does that mean? Well, it would have meant that he didn't follow uh, the requirements of the law at that stage. So that meant he would have felt free to uh, eat the meats that Jewish people abstain, or, uh, abstain from because of the Old Testament law. And so this is what he's saying. To those outside the law, he became one outside the law. And here again, there's a stipulation uh, that, that when he's saying outside the law, he's talking about the Old Testament laws, the law of Moses. But he's not outside the law of God, but he's under the law of Christ. And again, he refers to the law of Christ in some of his other Gospels as well. But the purpose for this is that he might win those outside the law. So much of what the Apostle Paul is trying to do is to, to share the gospel message. And he's willing to, to adapt to his situations as need be, to adapt to different cultures. He's willing to, to put his life down, so to speak, so that he can reach others with the good news of Jesus Christ. This is how he's becoming a servant. This is how Paul is choosing to use the freedom he has. And freedom is a big topic in 1 Corinthians uh, because the Corinthians felt they, they had these freedoms and those freedoms could mean that they could do what they want. And Paul is saying, we have these freedoms, but they're for a purpose. It's, it, it's not just a case that we've been freed from the law and freed from these things, but we have also been freed for something. And what is that something? Well, it's the gospel. It's building the kingdom of God. This is what we as Christians have been freed for. And if we've been freed for this, how can we engage and, and not look at building the kingdom of God or sharing our faith with others as a chore that we're required to do? How instead can we look at it as a privilege? How can we turn things around and change our attitudes and lay down our life as Paul does to reach those that we know the gospel will have a tremendously positive impact upon. And in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 22, he continues with a reference to the weak. Now, this is picking up from what he's talking about, 1 Corinthians 8, where he's been talking about food that has been sacrificed to idols and how for some of those at the time, new Christians who had come into the faith, uh, to them, to see Christians uh, eating at temples where food has been sacrificed to idols would have sent the wrong message. It would have perhaps even led them astray. So they, they had weak consciences that didn't necessarily understand the freedom that they had been given in Christ. But Paul is saying that just because Corinthians had this freedom doesn't mean they should use it, especially they should not use it when it causes those with a weaker conscience to stumble. And so this is what he's talking about. To the weak, I became like the weak. I shared their, 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 their view of the world so that he can win them over, so that he can help them understand the truth of the gospel. And when in due time they understand the truth of the gospel, maybe the time will come when they will no longer need to worry about whether food has been sacrificed to idols because they will understand the truth that there is one true God and that all the other so-called gods are just false gods and that there is nothing to be fear because there is one creator God and he has shown through Jesus Christ that he is for them. Uh, but this is what Paul is talking about here when he's talking about to the weak he became weak that he might win the weak. Uh, but he goes on to say, I have become all things to all people. Now by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. So here he's saying the reason 
he does all this. The reason he becomes a servant isn't because it's a chore, but rather he does all this so that other people can hear the gospel message. For the sake of the gospel is why he behaves like this, so that he can share with them in the gospel's message, can share with them the good news. You know, Paul was passionate about uh, evangelism. We see that. And I understand that as Christians, we don't always feel that, that, that we can be like the Apostle Paul. You know, the Apostle Paul can sometimes seem like a very hard example to follow. You know, he sacrificed so much for the sake of sharing the gospel with the Gentiles. And maybe we think even as we're reading these scriptures, I'm not sure I can do that. But the Apostle Paul isn't asking us to do everything that he did. What he's asking us is to really think about the gospel as good news, to think about what we're doing, not in terms of necessarily doing everything the Apostle Paul did, but thinking about it in terms about how we, in our lives, in our present circumstances, with our giftings and, and blessings that God has given us in our life, how can we use what we have for the sake of the gospel? And sometimes using what we have for the sake of gospel means sacrifice. It means giving up something that, that on the face of it seems important to us, but when we view it in the greater scheme of things, has no significance. Because at the end of the day, what we're sharing with them is greater than anything else. We are sharing them the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done with them. We're telling them about the salvation they have been given in Jesus Christ. We're helping them to have a new relationship with the Father, to share in Jesus' relationship with the Father. And of course, we need to understand that whenever we engage in evangelism, it's never us on our own. We do this as part of the wider body of Christ. We do this with the Holy Spirit at work in our lives and, and in the lives of those we're meeting. And of course, we know, as Jesus tells us in the Great Commission, when he tells us to go out and to make disciples of all nations, that he is present with us to the very end of the age. We never engage in evangelism alone, but like Paul, let us not view it as, uh, as a chore or as even a paid job, but rather let us view it as something where we share with the people we're sharing the gospel with in the blessings of the gospel with them. This is the good news. This is the reward. Uh, the reason why the Apostle Paul wanted to be able to do this for free and not charge anybody, even those who you know have come to faith for some years, not even to accept their support, because he wanted to be able to do this for free. This is how Paul wanted to use the freedom he had been given in Jesus Christ. And this is how he's encouraging the Corinthian church to use their freedom. Don't use their freedom as something to exalt in, but rather use their freedom for the sake of the gospel. As we reflect on this passage of scripture, there are some key thoughts that um, I th think it would be good to leave us with. As we think through the Apostle Paul and what he went through in terms of sharing the gospel, and again, that can be a little bit intimidating. And we don't need to necessarily think that we're going to go to the local synagogue and, 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 and be whipped because we say something that they disagree with. We know that's probably not even going to happen in our society. But if we stop for a moment and think about our lives, who in your life needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ? And who might need to hear this even if they fight against it, even if they, they seem not to want to know anything about Christianity, who are the people in your life who most need to hear it? And if they really need to hear it, maybe that is the encouragement we need to share it with them, even though it might make things difficult for us. And, you know, this brings us to the next key thought that the Apostle Paul was able to answer. And I know for many of us as Christians, we can struggle with. Are we able to lose status for the sake of Christ? Are we willing to accept being rejected for the sake of Christ? Now, this is something I struggled with in my early life. And sometimes, I'll be honest, I still do struggle with it. I remember going to, to work, um, uh, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago now, and people would talk about Christians and, uh, uh, you know, people that they didn't like. And, 
the whole time they would do that, I would never volunteer the fact that I was a Christian. I would never speak up in support of the Christians because I felt that Christians were being judged and I didn't want my co-workers to judge me. And this is a clear example in my own life about where I wasn't willing to lose status for the sake of Christ. And I hope that that has changed. I hope that if I was put back into the same circumstances, I would be braver with my faith. I would speak up and speak up in defense of, of Christianity, but more importantly, in defense of Jesus Christ, because that is the essence of the gospel. It's not what Christians are doing. It's what Christ has done for us. And the final kind of thought that I would like to leave you with is, you know, how do we, how, do, how does this play out in our lives? Can we lay down our own rights or our own freedom in a way that would help us to gain a hearing from others who need some good news in their life, who need Jesus Christ in their life? Are there situations where maybe what we really need to do is to lay down our freedoms, to give up some of our rights, to help them be able to hear the good news and to see us demonstrate the good news in our lives. As we end this message today, let me end it in prayer. Please join me in praying. Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you so much for the Apostle Paul. We thank you. We thank you for his heart for the gospel, for his heart for sharing the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, with the world, Lord. And Father, it's amazing to think that, you know, almost 2,000 years later that, you know, we are here professing faith as a consequence of perhaps what the Apostle Paul did at that time, Lord. And Father, it's wonderful the way that you work in our lives, Lord, that you, you work in history. And Father, you have chosen to work through human beings, flawed human beings who get it wrong. But Father, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you for the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, that our sins have been forgiven, that we have this hope, you know, the hope of the new creation to come, the hope of the return of your son, Jesus Christ, and the gift you've given us through the Holy Spirit, which we see at work in our lives and in the lives of our, our fellow Christians around us, Lord. And Father, as we think about this passage of Scripture, Father, we pray that you help us to follow in the footsteps of Paul, who in turn was following in the footsteps of your son. Father, we help us to not try to hold on to the status we have at the cost of the gospel. Help us to be willing to, to lose status. Help us to be willing to make the sacrifices in our life that we need to make for the sake of your gospel, of your good news, for the sake of building the kingdom of God. Because, Father, we know that that is the most precious thing we have in our life. Nothing we have is of the same value, even remotely, Lord. And so, Father, let us give up everything we have for the sake of the gospel. And, Father, we know that we need help doing that. That's not something that is, is natural. That's not something that is part of our sinful nature. We can only do that through you at work in us, through your Holy Spirit at work in us, Lord. And, and so, Father, we just pray for your help. Please let us be your messengers. Please let us share the good news and let us do it not for the sake of, you know, it being a chore, but let us fix our eyes firmly on, on the reward, the reward that comes from sharing the good news with others, of sharing in the blessings of the gospel with others, Lord. And so we just, we give everything over to you. We praise you. I ask that you be with everybody listening to this, this, this message, Lord. Please encourage them and be with them whatever their circumstances may be. And we say this in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, thank you so much for joining me for this message today. And I do hope that you will join us uh, for the Bible study this coming Wednesday at 7.30pm. Uh, so please do uh, uh, try and join us then. Uh, and we'll also be back next Sunday at 11am uh, with another YouTube premiere. So please don't uh, forget us then as well. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Mm -hmm.